Welcome to the HCI family of podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Bria Davis, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here today. It's a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from Seattle. I'm joined by Angela Schill. And today we're going to be talking with Bria about navigating the transition and how mothers transitioning back into the business world and arena can effectively manage the challenges they might encounter. Uh, some of this might be in relation to, you know, work-life integration, family issues as it relates to career. Um, these are the types of things we'll explore together today. And I'm just thrilled to have a chance to pick your brain, Bria, today as we uh, have this conversation. As we get started, I wanted to share Bria's bio with everybody. Bria is a wellness coach and motivational speaker specializing in empowering new moms to find balance, live healthy, and pursue their passion and purpose. As a mom of two, a mompreneur with a background in health and business development, she understands the unique challenges faced by new moms and has dedicated her career to helping them achieve holistic well-being. Anything else you would like to just share by way of background, personal context before we get into the broader story. No, I think that that kind of sums it up. Thank you for sharing that. Well, Bria, just let's just jump in and talk about navigating this, the transition that we're all here to talk about, which is mothers moving back into the business arena after having children and kind of making that foray back into the business world. And maybe you can talk about some of the challenges that that you have studied and maybe you've experienced yourself and and how to effectively manage those. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's an interesting point to actually talk through because I myself have um, gone back to the corporate life uh, two times after having both of my girls. And um, in the past, I've experienced my mother going back to a career after my brother and I graduating from high school. So she waited all the way until we got up to high school before entering back in the workforce. And so now I am on my mompreneur journey. And so I have a unique perspective, I think, from both sides of the coin. And so here's kind of how I look at it. I think there's a couple of things that we can um, think through and being able to effectively manage um, the challenges that come up. But I think the first thing is embracing a flexible mindset. Mm. And that's being open to pivoting and adapting to the new circumstances. It's for those of us who may have um, a first time coming back into the workforce, it's it's very new. And there's a lot of things that you probably didn't take into consideration in the beginning um, that just that pops up. There's things that we can't um, plan for. But if we change our mindset from I can't to how can I, I believe the result will most likely have a positive ending. And then if we leverage the transferable skills that um, we've gained, whether it's three to four months after birth or even 18 years, I think becoming a mom um, ignites a new strength <laughs> that we didn't even know that we had. And so if we lean into those strengths, um, it becomes an enabler to our confidence level and to help the over uh, overcome the challenges that that do come up. And then lastly, I would say um, finding a network and being able to seek guidance. Um, there's employee network groups, there's communities, maybe there's someone within your, your own village that you can connect with, or there's a mentor, um, people that have navigated similar transitions. As moms, we tend to feel that we can, um, we have to do it all on our own but there is actually less stress in help. So knowing who you can talk to and how, how to navigate those changes, I think are really important. Well, there's such interesting ideas that I love having had similar experiences in my own yes. life. Just, <laughs> yes. just that idea of, we talk about flexibility and things like that. And I think I I know in, in my experiences, I've kind of stepped into things thinking, 
it has to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. But as soon as mm -hmm. I can let go of that firm structure, I can get a lot more done. And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to look a certain way. It being flexible makes you, I think, also pull on those skills that you've gained as a mother that are transferable and honoring those and respecting them as something that's valuable in the workspace. I think that's, you've hit it's on some- true. It's true, especially for those of us who are a little type A, where we feel like we have to <laughs> check boxes and have projects yes. and things have to just go a certain way. It, that transition is rough, but <laughs> embracing that mindset for me was was key, number one. <laughs> I, I'm curious what your both of your experiences have been as you've re-entered the workforce after taking uh, some time away. You know, we, we talk about the transferable skills, you know, and I think my guess is if you talk to the average dude that, you know, who is leading a team and having someone come back that they're thinking, yeah, I want to be flexible. Yeah. I want to, you know, be accommodating. Um, yeah. A mom is amazing and there's all these skills that they have, et cetera. I think, but there's a disconnect, I think between kind of the, the, the general thinking of a lot of guys that might be in positions um, where they're experiencing that versus like then how they treat the woman who's actually returning to their team or returning to the workforce. Have you experienced that gap? And like, how have you dealt with that? Yeah, it's interesting because the, my second, for my second little one, um, my manager or my leader at the time, he didn't have any kids and um, he wasn't, he was married, but um, it was very weird. I mean, I don't know what well, I don't know what the uh, ethical thing is to do when people say I'm expecting. I don't know if you're required to not say anything at all, but it was it wasn't a congratulations. It was just like, OK, so when do you plan on leaving? And um, then he actually left during my maternity leave. And it was just very odd because when I was in the hospital, um, actually, this is my first one. When I was in the hospital, um, I had called him because it was six weeks early. She was a mm -hmm. pre and I told him, I was like, I have to take my leave early and um, I'm at the hospital and I'm getting ready to deliver. <laughs> and this was, you know, two, three months prior to when I was expecting to go on leave. And he was like, well, what do I do? And so I had to just, I just had to lay it out very clear the, that I can no longer work. I'm setting those boundaries <laughs> for him to know this is the day that I'm taking off and you need to figure out after because we set a plan a leave plan it's just going to have to come in sooner than later I cannot I cannot have any more conversation after we get off of the phone and um I will speak with you when I return so I think letting those um boundaries be <laughs> sticking to the boundaries that you have and letting them know like what you're actually dealing with communicating that I think those are very important because I think a lot of times we we feel like we're people are mind readers, especially sometimes I feel like my husband should be reading my mind, but uh, they are not mind readers. We have to communicate. We have to tell them and set those boundaries, especially in the workplace. Otherwise, and they wouldn't know. They just will never know. And so um, I think those are kind of some of the challenges that I've come up with in the past that i have able to just communicate the boundaries very clearly and ensure that like he understood this is what's going to happen. Um, but say it, say it with, with confidence and kindness mm. at the same time. <laughs> that, that. that for me was a little traumatic because I, it was almost as if, do you not see in my, hear my voice that I'm at the hospital early. <laughs> so, but you know, everyone has different, different scenarios, circumstances, and as long as you know how to communicate them, um, that's all you can really do. You talk about confidence and kindness at the same time. There's like a piece of self-advocacy, but also yes. walk the person down the path with you because sometimes you're figuring it out as you go as well. But mm -hmm. having that confidence to advocate for yourself is so important too. And figuring out so. Yes. I'm also wondering if, because um, you just shared an example of where you left a job and returned to that job. And I'm wondering if, if you have personally, or perhaps with those you've worked with and coached, you know, seen people who have left for a period maybe the workforce altogether. And they're, when they decide to return, it might even be a while later, not just maternity leave, but maybe they took a, a, an extended period and now they're trying to re-enter maybe even years later. Mm -hmm. um, that seems like that would be exceptionally challenging. 
No, absolutely. I think there's a few different um, obstacles that we as women might be experiencing. And a lot of the clients that I work with, they come to me because they don't necessarily feel like they have um, qualifications. So when we talk about that confidence gap, um, I let them know, I'm like, hey, we can acknowledge some of those doubts, but let's also focus on the strengths and experiences that make them valuable in the workforce. And if there's a specific skill that they need to get updated on or they need to upskill, um, I have them go and do some research around investing in what that skill is that they need in that particular field. There's actually so much more resources now. Um, I think I just saw Google is offering some free courses. Harvard offers free online courses. Once they actually determine that path and we kind of walk down what that looks like, those desires and those goals, they can look up what those required skills are and then start reading and start listening to different podcasts within that field to kind of help um, upskill that area. And then if they have a very big um, gap in the resume, I actually emphasize to them to um, to volunteer in some areas mm-hmm. where they feel interested in those fields and also begin to work as a freelancer, whether it's part-time or a few hours a week, um, they could be shadowing or getting an understanding of what it takes for them to go back into that field. And a lot of times they're not going back into what they used to do. Um, mm-hmm. they, they really have experienced some type, some type of growth or some sense of self-awareness where they know here's actually kind of where I'm leading to. And it's a completely new path. My mom was an educator before um, my brother and I, uh, before she had us, and she actually went into nursing. <laughs> so there there was that that huge um, skill difference, but she realized what she wanted to do. She went back on her CNA license and she was able to be a nurse from there. So um, so yeah, that those are kind of the, the couple of things that I walk my clients through as, as they begin to identify those goals, especially if there is a huge gap in them re-entering the workforce. Those are great. Those are great Ad- advice for people trying to get to get through that that gap. And as you're talking about um some of these challenges, I don't know if this is along that same path, but how can they when mothers are re-entering the workforce, how can they take those challenges that they're facing? And I don't know if you want to outline more of what those are, but also how can they turn those into opportunities? And you've kind of talked about that. Yes, yes. I always say when you don't have, you don't know what you don't know. Like I I said that earlier, but having that community or networking group that you can go to and say, here's what I am going through. Here's what I'm looking for. I think a lot of times, um, Back in the day, I would say, I don't know what years it would be. Don't quote me on the years, but it, it was a lot to go to the golf course. It was more of a social and business thing. It's still somewhat like that today. I think there's actually stats that say a per certain a certain percentage of CEOs actually golf, and that's where they do business on the, on the course. Women can do the same thing. We love brunching. I'm a millennial, so brunch is definitely a weekend thing for me, but there's a lot of networking brunches out here more specifically where I go to and I learn. I And I, when I speak to these women, I'm asking them, what do you know that I don't know? Who do you know that I need to know? And asking very intentional questions to be able to help expand that network and overcome um, those blocks that might come up, I think is very key, especially in today's society when we're doing everything online and virtual. You got to get back out there. Yeah. We have to... Um, kind of st- put our t- step our toe out and and just risk it a little bit. You have to get a little bit uncomfortable to to overcome some of those challenges. And how do you find those communities? You're saying you go t- to brunches, you find these these yep. groups. How do you suggest people find those places of support? There's eventbrite.com, there is brownbag.com. There's a lot of event um websites. If you just go to Google and type in women's networking, you can do that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's different rotaries in every city that you can go to and connect. Wow. With. Um, and then there's also a handy dandy Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook, if you type in a specific group that you have an interest in, like for me, a couple years ago, I, I went to a group called um, Moms of Toddlers on Facebook, and I was able to connect with multiple women. Um, there's also a couple of groups that you can Google as far as um, specific interests, women in tech, women in um, partnerships or channel. So 
using the keywords and highlighting what you're actually interested in, those are going to be able to pop up. And you always want to put near me. Um, that way yeah. it's local. You don't have to, you know, travel too far. And some of them might be virtual, which is perfectly fine as well. Um, but those are kind of the typing in those keywords on those different event sites that you're going to be able to find the network that you're looking for. I love that. And then just having the having the courage to go and be uncomfortable and yes. ask questions. And I love asking the question, even what questions should it be, I be asking? What don't I, when you say, you know, what don't I know? What questions should I be asking that I'm not? Exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and that courage piece, I'm wondering how you foster more of that. Uh, and I, part of it may be a personality thing, um, you know, sure. or or depending on the, the amount of time someone has spent out of the workforce, maybe, you know, there's a different level of anxiety around that. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of my wife in particular, and, you know, we have six children. She spent an extended period of time out of the workforce, at least full-time. She worked part-time. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it, it was really hard for a variety of reasons. It was really hard for her um, to, to go back into full-time employment to even want to. And then when she wanted to, to feel like she could, and like just the, the confidence piece, like she's a very intelligent, confident woman, like very mm -hmm. capable. So it's not like a general lack of confidence. It was, but it was like in this specific um, instance of like, I got to like reconnect with people and network and like do all these uncomfortable things after you've been out of the game for so long. I mean, how do you, how do you broach that with someone who's just not feeling it? Yeah, that's, that is so, um, that is a very common, that is a very common fear as well. Like it's, it's a little fear and that's okay for it to be a little fear or concern, whatever we want to call. Um, but I, it's a common one that I connect with when I'm like, um, in first working with women. And what we typically do is we kind of have to start from the beginning. We talk through our, your values, your vision and your mission. And once you kind of identify what the what your values are, what your vision is, what your mission is, you have to then visualize and see consistently what that looks like. And that should be a motivator to um, enabling you to continue to move that needle forward. And once you kind of write down that end goal, then we work our way backwards and we start from one step to step two, because <laughs> it can get really overwhelming just thinking about, okay, I have to do all these things in order to, um, to get to that angle. But if you just focus on the first step, once you hit that, the next step, the little milestones that you're hitting that continue. And as you hit them, you begin to get more confidence. And that's why I always let uh, my clients know right now I'm reading um, 15 Invaluable Laws of Growth, a lot of growth books that um, really kind of help you meditate. And um, it's a mindset thing that allow you to just continue to nurture. You have to nurture it. Otherwise, if it's not being nurtured, you're going to continue to be stuck and you're going to continue to feel that feeling of overwhelm and anxiety. And that is, for me, I'm saying the enemy, but it's, it's, it's the adversary, okay? <laughs> and so um, putting your mind towards what you want how you want it to, to align with your vision, value, and goals. Those are the first, that's the first step. And then continuing to nurture your mindset with um, things that are bringing value to, to what you want is going to be key. And that book, 15 um, Invaluable Laws of Growth by John Maxwell, it, it's really good. And that first chapter actually talks through um, exactly what we're talking about, what we may lack and how we want, how we can overcome it. You know, I'm looking at myself and my own challenges that are kind of similar to what John's describing with his wife. I've had some of those where I've come in and out. Um, and to have that overall arching vision and that succeed. mission, I mean, that that helps, that could help pull you out of any anxiety, Red. I think if you could just stay focused and be intentional on, okay, what are my goals? Why am I doing this? And I think that's where you could pull out some of those those extra strengths and those powers and kind of take what you've utilized in one part of your life and apply it into another in really, in really um, propelling ways. And celebrating the little things that you have accomplished. I think a lot of us, we minimize the, the small wins and I, it just gives us more confidence. Once we get to that one first step, the second step, it's, it gives us more confidence to continue and to keep being motivated to push on. Because we're not being motivated every day. 
but it gives us, it helps us kind of keep that discipline level going. Well, and I think, I mean, just what you do, you know, you're talking about mentoring these, these women and kind of helping helping them walk through the path. I think having another person to say, notice this, see what you're doing and helping that intentionality is so vital. And I'm wondering if you could talk about more about, we've, we've already talked a bit about this, but the available resources and support systems for mothers that are embracing like your, like what you, you know, their entrepreneurial or their corporate paths and how, how can they navigate that return? Yes. So. Yes. I think there's a couple of things to think through um, when it comes to that. Uh, the first is um, knowing or finding or looking for a professional and per personal development program. I think those are always really cool, especially now the, the many different ones that are out there. Um, there's things such as masterminds that um, many groups and coaches or cohorts um, networks have been a part of or kind of launched that gear to specifically what the type of development you're looking for. Um, there's a lot of return to work programs that are out here. I can't think of the actual names of the websites, but there's one that's, um, if you just Google return to work for moms, there's plenty of sites that are out there that actually provide that. Um, and then actually going to different workshops that are designed for re-entering into the workspace. There's a lot of resources that you can um, look up and you can attend just from virtual. I know a lot of them are virtual because a lot of moms are just thinking about it and they don't have the flexibility quite thin to um, right. make, those, make those events. The second is um, seeking organizations that they want to work for that have a flexible, um, that provide flexibility in the workspace. So um, I always say, I'm not going to work for a company where I have to be stuck on my computer. And I, you know, those are part of my mission. I'm not doing that. <laughs> so if they <laughs> offer looking for roles that offer um, flexible schedules or remote work options, those are going to help support the, um, the goals that we as moms want to be able to have, especially if we have younger children. And then also lastly, I think um, coaching is always a great resource to have. Um, I myself, even though I am a coach, I also have a coach, <laughs> um, but finding a coach that aligns with your vision and values that can help you navigate through that journey. It helps you stay accountable. It helps you um, kind of keep moving the needle and it gives you the confidence to, or in a different perspective to be able to, to move forward through that embracing that. Like I said, I'm, I came from corporate. I'm embracing the entrepreneurial journey. That's very different. It's very risky. <laughs> I can't forecast what's going to happen two years from now. I guess maybe not even in your job anymore these days, but um, there's a lot more. So I need that coach to kind of help me. Okay, how can I navigate this? So those are three areas I think would be a good um, support system that we can embrace. To, to what extent can career exploration be part of this? I think especially if you've taken an extended amount of time away. Um, I, I think, again, I'm, I can't help but just think of the example of my wife and you know, she, before we started having children, she was a middle school math teacher. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's what she did. And that's what she wanted to do. And she knew she wanted to do that. And that was what she was going to do the rest of her life, right? And then eventually, when she was going to go back to teach, she was going to be a middle school math teacher. Um, fast forward a bunch of years. And now she's a university uh, math teacher. She's a professor. She teaches, you know, statistics, business calculus and stuff. That transition of like mindset shift of like her skill set, which serves both, but to like, for her to transition from like, I'm, this is the thing I want to do versus, Hey, there's all these up other opportunities and I can do something completely different. You know, that took quite a while. Um, and yeah, thoughts around like the career exploration piece, especially if you're reentering after a long time. Yes. Yes. I would say, um, and this is a lot of things that we actually work through with my clients. So this is a very good question. It's common for sure. Um, but I think the first step, and I, I think a lot of people, they always think about, okay, I don't know what I want to do, but figure out your priorities, define what the priorities look like. A lot of us as moms, we are looking to, uh, maintain balance and prevent burnout that, that I think is kind of the, the stuck point. We just, we got to, we're trying to figure out how we can manage it all. 
Um, and I think there's a couple of things that we need to do before that. So having to set, um, defining the balance, I think what we start out is we have an activity where we have a column where we have for home and a column for the business. And then we align each of those items to each of the desires that they're looking for. For example, um, if they prioritize their mornings with their family at home, then choosing a role or a career that allows them to set their own schedule would be a benefit. Or if they want to ensure that they don't miss any pageants or games for that new role of exploration, they're probably gonna have to find a role that doesn't require any travel, right? And then um, once they define what those priorities are in their own home and what they want in, in a job, then we explore and say, we have to set some realistic expectations <laughs> and acknowledge that the balance is a constant adjustment. It doesn't have to, it's not going to be the same, especially the different milestones that our kids hit. Toddler stage is completely different from high school age, right? So it's okay to recalibrate um, when needed. And then in order to figure out um, how to balance it, we got to write down how, what need, what can be delegated? I like to say, what doesn't require the mom's touch? <laughs> okay. Um, so we can't be afraid to seek help and delegate the tasks both at work and at home. If we're looking to figure out what that um, position looks like still, then we go through, okay, if I'm going to be working full time and I'm coming, maybe I'm a stay at home mom right now. What are the things that I'm doing that I'd like to delegate out that don't, don't require my actual, um, my hands or my labor and who at home, and this might be for the ones who have older kids um, or have some people, some of us, some, some of them have um, grandparents that live there, aunts, uncles, if they're a more um, family oriented family, but who at home can we use? I always, um, I have, uh, there's so many different resources for a delegation. I outsource my groceries. So I have them go on um, Instacart and say, okay, look, this is actually very simple. It's maybe seven, 10 bucks a month for you to actually use this service. Just put your grocery list on here and have them deliver it weekly. Um, then there's laundry services. I hate doing laundry. I haven't <laughs> gotten to the point where I've outsourced it yet, but I absolutely hate it. Um, but that is definitely a service that's provided. Cleaning services. While I can't clean um, weekly and some of us might not be able to afford a weekly clean, what if you can have someone come once a month to do the deep cleaning for you. That way you can take the rest of those weeks to just, you know, lightly wipe down things or sanitize whatever it may need, but your home won't look absolutely crazy at the end of that month, have someone come in um, and then figuring out um, who can actually do those tasks. Some of us give our kids chores. And so just having the ability to delegate that out. And um, if you are married, communicating with your spouse, here's what I need from you. Here's um, how I need you to support me. I think communication is always key in those areas because um, a lot of times maybe uh, the father is working nine to five or maybe he works at night. So understanding what those circumstances around you look like and being able to communicate what that help is, um, being in really intentional and making it your own schedule. You are the CEO of your home and you can do it. I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, Bria, this has just been a really great conversation. I think we could go on and on, but I note the time and we need to let you go here in just a minute. Before we wrap things up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can find me at thrivewithbria.com. Um, you can schedule any one-on-one -on -one coaching. I do free consultations um, for the first call. And I'm actually um, going to be launching a mastermind series on personal development with the actual book, The 15 Laws of Invaluable Growth um, from John Maxwell. I'll be launching that in January 2nd. So you can message me on uh, at thrivewithbria.com to learn a little bit more about that. Um, but I'm happy to, to connect on any and all things mommy duties. So, um, but lastly, I would like to just um, acknowledge all the moms who are listening. Um, doesn't matter what age you are or what age your little ones are. You are amazing. 
you are um, a super mom and we're redefining what that super mom means. It doesn't mean that you're doing it all. It means that you're finding the balance that um, is for you. And I am so excited to, um, if you if you would love me to be a part of your journey and help you find that balance. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate this conversation. It was great. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Bria can do for you. Thank you, Angela, for joining us in the conversation. Bria, it's just been a pleasure. And as always, we hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And we hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.